to nature revisited. Often, when I was gardening professionally, I would try to get people to look at their gardens differently. Now, I am hoping to get people to change the way they think about nature and to see that we are nature and that that relationship, which has always been there, is as diverse as nature itself. The focus of Nature Revisited is to illustrate just how diverse those relationships can be. And Larry Doyle illustrates this beautifully. Larry is a needle worker, and he has been doing needlework for most of his life. I have known Larry for some time now, and when we meet, he often talks about his life, his craft, and nature, and how they are all connected. He has a wonderful way of telling a story, or talking about his craft with passion and humor. And I have come to look forward to those times when we happen to meet. So I sat down with him recently at his apartment to once again talk about nature, needlepoint, and growing up. And Larry did not disappoint. I grew up in Saugus, Massachusetts. My parents were both from Lynn. And early on, my father had a small boat and we would trailer it up to Newberry, Massachusetts and put it in the Parker River and take it out to Ipswich Bay. And we would beach with our summer community on Cranes Beach right across from Little Neck. We were immersed in nature all weekend and during the week as well, but this, these Sundays were climactus for all of us and now we're all in our latter 60s and we still recall what an influence it had on us, just us being of nature and trampling on raw nature, the beach running into the ocean, swimming down the current. Those are all things. And I remember clearly when I was doing that young, I would abstractly put things together in my mind that I was visualizing. So when I began to paint, which was when I was around 15, I didn't necessarily sit there and paint what was in front of me, but it was motivation for me to paint and to use the properties of color to express myself. I ran into a woman, not really ran into her. <laughs> I went down to the hardware store in Saugus. It was a little hardware store with creaky wooden floors and the smell of a hardware store. And uh, there was an older lady speaking to Mr. Allen about finding a boy Friday, so to speak, someone who could do errands and wash her kitchen floor. So I applied for the job. And after negotiations, I took her name and address on a slip of paper and the next Saturday morning, I walked from my mother's house, which was five minutes to Cliftondale Square, to the address on this slip of paper, which brought me to a house that I had wanted to go into ever since I can remember. I went up the stairs and met this lady Miss Dawson had been retired a number of years. This was in the late 60s, and it was just like an old educated lady's house. She gave me directions to clean her house in Latin. She discussed our little lunch in Greek. And I was going to say before, she had graduated from Radcliffe in 1905. 
taught her whole life and traveled her entire life. She never married. She was the old maid school teacher who had a very wealthy life. <laughs> and I don't think Emma made a great deal of money, but she made a real interesting project of living. So what she was really doing in so many ways was telling me that, yes, Saugus, Massachusetts is a lovely little town to grow up in. It's safe. People are nice here, but there's a big world out there. And she would tell me stories of her travels when she was here and there and so on and so forth. One Saturday when I finished with her, I went downstairs to meet the owner of this wonderful house, whose name was Anstress Kellogg. She was a very old Saugus lady. And she had been head of the art department for some 40 years. She was good. She was very good. And she shared the downstairs with a longtime companion, Gwendolyn Walters, who at the time was still teaching math in the eighth grade. But she also was involved in craft and art. And when I met her, she was doing needlework. And Anstress was doing all sorts of other things. I applied for a job to help her maintain her gardens. I was hired, and we developed an instant intimate relationship with one another. And she became a true mentor to me. And she really taught me about art and how to look at it and how to sense it and how to produce from your mind. And in no time, I had a paintbrush in my hand. I'd do her lawn and such, and she might say to me, why don't you go get your paint box and have a lunch? I'll pick you up and we'll go down to Essex and paint the marshes. And we would do just that. We would go down and we would set up our equipment together and she would advise me on doing this and doing that. And I would be behind her and watch her paint and she would be in front of me and we'd be, we would talk about the day and talk about how the tide was coming in or when it last went out or what were those birds nesting up in there and then suddenly they might be on our canvas. We don't know because it's a spontaneous thing that happens. And we continued to build this relationship and I, I'm very aware of when I began to appreciate what she was not telling me, but showing me in reality how we deeply depend on and deeply relate to nature and how important it is for us as natural human beings to always identify with it and to be with it. And I treasure all of those past memories. They're all to me to be vital and have worked for me. I mean, my life, as far as I'm concerned, is, is comfortable the way I wanted it. <laughs> and I was with Mrs. Kellogg one evening. They were going to give me keys to the house for the weekend. They were going to the New York World's Fair, and I was going to oversee the house while they were gone. I was 16 years old, I think. And uh, the telephone rang. Mrs. Kellogg went to answer it. Miss Walters was working on a piece of bargello, which is a form of needlepoint. And I just turned my head and watched. And she got up and came over and handed me this piece and said, why don't you just try it? I took these components to needlepoint, and they felt like they had been in my hands before. It was really deja vu. And I picked it up then, and Needlepoint is a constant companion of mine, whether I'm stitching it, whether I'm at an exhibit to look at it, if I'm in somebody's home and I watch them or I experience them. It's really, I think, part of my DNA. Oh, and I should step back a moment. When I began, just began to do needlework, I made a promise to myself that I would become so familiar with this skill that I could simply take a blank canvas 
and stitch composition that was gratifying for me and had meaning from my inner soul. And all of those things and sensations are all things that come from nature. And they manifest themselves differently in everyone. And then to see them kind of line up with one another and then intertwine and embrace is to me the crux of human intimacy. And it all comes from nature, running on the beach, swinging on an oak tree, poking your friend in the nose. <laughs> <laughs> and my family was also very encouraging with all of us. I'm one of six with one of us. And my mother would often say, well, it all goes back to basics. Start with nature. <laughs> Before we go into what, a little bit of the history at Needlepoint, talk just a little bit about how Needlepoint is influenced by nature. The preparation sometimes for something is the connection to it. Yes, it is. There are all kinds of dyes, and this is a lanolin dye that's improved, as I gather. These were made in Switzerland. And there are natural dyes from onion skins and all sorts of various seashells and various things that I've not found in a medium uh, that is as compatible with me as this is. You stitch on a canvas that is really strictly made into squares, which they call a grid, and they come in different sizes, 32 holes to an inch. When you get comfortable, I think, with any craft, you learn the skills of the craft. And they are then second nature to you. You can just get up and do them. When you relax and you know you have the skills and you can just pick up a needle and do things, it's so satisfying to know that it just transferred from nature when you think of what you're doing, you're taking shapes from nature, you're taking colors from nature, you're picking up textures that nature is providing with how the sun hits the sand and the water. Um, and it gives dimension to your work and suddenly you find yourself doing it. The history of Needlepoint, has it always been connected to nature? Needlepoint has been around for many hundreds of years, and it has always been in a more sophisticated arena than a lot of other needleworks. I think in reality, most all of what we do, especially that's in any sort of a decorative sense, something that is going to garnish our life with rhythm, and beauty and sensitivity have all been really derived from nature. And the, the properties of what nature has given to the artist is in then his or her interpretation of what that medium represents to me. And I think all artists really do truly want to encourage others. And I think that's one of, the, one of the advantages of Mother Nature is to take advantage of her enormous bounty that she just sits there for you to utilize and to enjoy and to share. I was on this little tiny island on a Swedish island that became French. This was really right out of a Greek romance. <laughs> and the colors, my, my head was always lubricated with color. I had a really lovely audience down there. I did, the, I do it outside. I was, you know, would always, I stitched forever in the restaurants. And if there was anyone who was Asian within eight miles, they would suddenly be standing at my table. 
needleworks in general, the Asian cultures, all of the Asian cultures have long, long histories of needlework. I don't think I've ever recall running into, and there probably is, but Asian needle point per se, but Asian embroidery is their, one of their national treasures. I met lots of people doing needlepoint in public. I think it's fun. It's a really, it's a really civilized way to meet people. And I know very well being a man sitting out there doing needlepoint is, you know, an eye catcher and I don't mind that at all. You know, I'll start the ball rolling. <laughs> A lot of people go into needlepoint really not knowing what the components are and how they are. What is the twist of the wool in the, the canvas itself? It's a whole bunch of crosses, and if you go across the cross and pull it too tight, it bends. But those are one of the joys of you know, learning this kind of thing absorbing it in time and time and time again, proving it yourself, so that you can then share it with someone else, so that someone else can enjoy the skill and get the result as much as you do. And that's a real natural process. And those sort of things happen with needlepoint. In relationship to these pieces, that I have hanging here and have given away that are about people that I have known. And they're not, they're not just people that I know and have known a long time, but people where I have really become bosomed with and people that I have found mentorial to me in growing my life. And when I was growing up, my parents were always telling us you were judged by the company you keep. And it doesn't matter if it's the man who runs the bank or the lady who cleans the bathroom or whatever it is. It's their character that you must insist upon. So the name of my collection is the company I keep. Where do you think Needlepoint is in coming and, back? Is oh, it? well, it's always around. It is always around. And I think it's around now in a way different than it has been in the past. We have so many other things that entertain us. Back in the day, this was entertainment. It was your signature of your life. And they didn't have YouTube. And it's evolutionized into something different as things are today. It follows a contemporary pattern. And it's still, though, a very ancient skill and craft. So stylistically, it can change, but its very basic concept is the same. So needlepoint is a very reliable skill for me to have to always be able to represent myself, my feelings through a medium that I know will be legible. I hope you enjoyed this edition of Nature Revisited. And that if you did, you will share with friends and family. As always, you can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. I hope you will join us again for the next episode of Nature Revisited. And until then, remember, we are nature. Nature.